right? They need help from others. That's where the collaborative teamwork comes in. So number one is getting on the same page with the uh, what is inclusive education because you can't move toward inclusion if everybody doesn't understand and agree what you, what it is you're talking about. And it might be a little bit different in different places. So what we encourage people to do is kind of take the base elements and then make it your own. You know, uh, reword it, change the language, whatever, make it your own, but everybody on the same page. The second thing <laughs> that we almost always have to get into are roles. What is the role, and this intersects with what I was just saying, what is the role of the general education teacher? Uh, what is the role of the special educator? What is their role collaborating together? What is the role of the assistant supporting the teacher? What is the role of the administrator, the family, the students, etc.? That's the second thing. Those two things really give you an important starting point. Um, it falls apart if you're in a situation like your colleague is in where she's trying to support a hundred students across five schools every week. I mean, it's not humanly possible, I don't think. At least not to do with any reasonable level, no matter how excellent she is and how hard she works. It's just too much. Um, so th those would be, I think, important. We found those to be consistent, foundational starting points. But then you really have to start looking at personnel utilization, uh, how many personnel. I do have some models that, I, that I've shared um, that we're using in Vermont. So for example, one of the models is uh, four classrooms in a school, in the same school. Now, I mean, let me just say, these are schools where they don't send children elsewhere. They have all the children that would typically attend their school go to their school regardless of what their disability is, uh, how severe their disability is. If, if that's the school they would go to, that's where they are. So that's one of the assumptions. Uh, and given that assumption, if you have, say, four classrooms, and each classroom might have roughly 20 to 25 students in it, and of those 20 to 25 students, typically you're gonna see maybe three or four students that have a disability of some sort in each class. Most of those students will have quite mild disability. Um, it, you wouldn't typically see more than one student that has a very significant disability in any class. It's possible, because you're gonna have you know, bubbles, everything's not even, right? That if, if this is the average, you're gonna have you know, like this. Um, but, uh, you know, so we have four classes, each with a teacher, and then one special educator is shared across the, those, those four classes. And we try as much as possible to have those classes be the same grade level, like all first grade, or if, we, if the school is very small, it might be first and second grade or you know whatever, but as close, uh, as narrow an um, age range as possible. And then, w in addition to one special educator, there might be one and a half uh, assistants that are shared. So you have uh, basically two and a half special education fa faculty, a, a, each, a special ed teacher and one and a half assistants shared among these four teachers and, um, and they work together as a team. Um, and then there are That's also- a good ratio. It's, it's yeah. a very nice ratio and then also, uh, there are other supports in the school. So for example, if you had a child that had very uh, uh, rare special needs like they were blind, then you would have access to somebody who has the kind of caseload that your friend has. Because we wouldn't, if those children who were blind or deaf or deaf blind or maybe even have autism uh, were in the class and somebody needed some extra specialized support, it would be a specialist who specializes in that, working with the special educator to build their capacity, to build their skills, as opposed to supplanting them. Okay. Uh, okay.
One more question. Yeah. Just be quick, what do yes. everybody opportunity to ask? Uh, do you use some tools uh, or do you have some uh, plans about uh, 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 building up the social conscience and competency about accepting the children in the society? Because for me, uh, inclusion is not only in the schools. It, it's, it's more important on the street than in the school. So uh, that, that's the, the hard thing, how to, to uh, make people accept everyone, because it's not special need, it's an individual need. So we all have them and we are accepted, so. And that's, I don't have a particular tool, but it's one of the reasons I mentioned yesterday that the, uh, the teacher as the model is so important because if, if the teacher models acceptance and welcome of an individual needs of all children, um, it is a very powerful tool in and of itself, and and it can change a generation. You know, we see um, my own children are now in their late thirties, right? Uh, when when I was growing up, we didn't see children with disabilities. My children grew up in classrooms with children who. Um, couldn't speak, children on, the, on their sports teams who had autism. And it was like, well, you know, it's normal. There's no, there's no big deal, right? So they're a completely different generation in terms of how they think about um, accepting people who are different than people who grow up separated. And it's one of the reasons why people with disabilities will never be uh, fully included in the society if they continue to only be in separate schools, separate work, separate living situations as adults, uh, because they're not part of the community. Um, uh, okay, I encourage everybody to drink some more coffee, maybe uh, be more talkative, <laughs> ask more questions. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is very interesting for me. Your name first. Oh, we met yesterday, so <laughs> my name is Ida from Croatia. Uh, uh, so, um, it is very interesting for me to uh, hear the things that you say because we have something like that, we call it the community of learners, when you talk about teamwork, it's community of learners. I just want to know a little bit more, what are your approaches? You say, okay, we have a teamwork, we need to work on our values, we need to work on our roles, but what is the, let's say, content of, uh, on which they talk about? What do they analyze in their teamwork? What is the concrete materials, for example, do they collect some pedagogical documentation on how they work with children with yeah. special needs and something like that? Yeah, so, and, and just to clarify, we're talking about the collaboration between the adults. Yes, the plan. Yeah, so it starts for us, for me, and I'm gonna give the example of a student that has uh, a developmental disability, because those are the children that I work with most who have intellectual and multiple disabilities. It starts with working with the family to identify the highest priorities mm -hmm. for that child's learning. And then we have, we conceptualize, kind of think of concentric circles, a small amount, a small circle in the middle that represents the most important learning outcomes for that child. And then a bigger circle that represents additional learning outcomes mm -hmm. uh, across many curriculum areas. So one of the things that's part of our IDEA law mm -hmm. is that children must have access to the general education curriculum. Because it used to be that uh, if you had a disability, uh, particularly if you had a developmental disability, they might teach you life skills only mm -hmm. and nobody would try to teach you to read or teach you to how to write or you know use a keyboard or do math or science or history or anything. Um, and so, our law requires that the students have access to all of the general education curricula as well. So you've got this bullseye of most important, you've got a bigger picture of curriculum, and then on the outer rim holding it together are the kinds of um, <coughs> general supports, things you do to or for a child to support them, whereas the things in the two inner circles are things where you wanna see behavior change on the part of the child. And then the collaboration, in terms of the content of the collaboration, comes around how do we uh, actually provide that instruction? Uh, in a, you know, can, some of it can be, it can be in different modes. Some of it can be one-to-one. -one. 
uh, tutoring. Some of it is going to be small group instruction. Some of it's going to be large group. And so a lot of the conversation is how do we do that um, when this child's skills are here and the rest of the children are here. And that's where that diamond diagram comes in in terms of multi-level, same content, multi-level different, curriculum overlapping, ways to think about do they need program changes or do they need support changes or both. And it might be different in different situations. How often do they meet together? Typically, uh, many teams would um, meet formally mm -hmm. once a week. Many. Um, yeah, many meet, meet once a week. But here's the thing. When, when you're in a situation like your friend is in, you can't meet. You can't meet with people. You, you, know, you show up, you do something quick, and you leave, and you go to the next. You do something quick. You know? When you have the model that I described before with four teachers, also, you're spending time in the classroom. So there's a lot of informal give and take and observing that's going on. And so the need to meet formally is reduced when you're spending more time with a smaller number of people because we're both seeing the same thing over there happening, the interaction happening between two students, for example. I don't have to sit and take 20 minutes to explain it to you because you saw it as I saw it. right? So the more uh, special educators are spending time in general education classrooms, the less need there is for formal meeting times. There's a shared need there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's move yeah. on. Yeah. 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 She'll say something about some practical problems. She is from the organization Lotus in the vicinity of Sarajevo. Uh, children who have sensory impairments, visual or blindness, they send, uh, or deafness, they send to Sarajevo to the center. Uh, children with uh, mild intellectual disabilities are there in their small city. They have a special school, elementary and high school, and also regular school. And according to the law, the parents have a choice whether they will enroll their children to the special school or to the regular school. Uvođenja asistenata još uvijek nije dovoljno plaćeno od države u školu. Introduction of assistance is not supported by the state, is not paid by the state. U neke škole to je tek počelo prije godinu dvije. It just recently started in some schools. I sada roditelji koji se odluče da uključe djete u redovnu školu i da ih djete ima asistenta, misle da će imaju prevenika očekivanja. And uh, parents usually have uh, very high expectations when they get assistance. They think that the child will become a genius if he has uh, an assistant. And that's a big challenge and a problem for school staff. Na primjer, onda je jedna od pravila ako ovaj imaju jedno dijete u sa smetnjama u razvoju, smanjuje se broj džaka za dva atipična djeteta. For example, we have a ratio principle. For example, if you have a child with developmental disabilities, then that class can have two students plus in total. I odredbe koji će učitelj primiti djete su vrlo administrativne. Znači, direktor određuje kojem će učitelju dati and the principal is the one who decides what a teacher will get the child with disabilities in their class. Without judging in that characteristics of the teacher. And and the teachers are very frustrated and are not motivated because they need to fight parents and they need to deal with parents of uh, typically developing children. 
Tako da imamo niz finih, moram reći finih, nekih teških situacija psiholoških koje je vrlo teško uskladiti. So we have a couple of, uh, several psychological challenges that are very hard to align. This is the same, many, many teachers in the U.S. would say the same thing. And lives of these children interfere with lives of teachers. Because these teachers are not well educated for these children. A jedna je čak rekla, ja ću vjerovatno napustiti ovaj posao, ne mogu više. One teacher said that she will probably leave her job because she cannot stand it anymore. Ne može više da se nosi s tim da je taj, recimo, dječak iz njenog razreda postao glavni član njene porodici. Because that child in the classroom became a main member of her family. Like when I translate literally, it probably means that that child got a very significant role in life because she talks about him all the time and that kind of thing. Što se tiče srednje škole, znači idu financira država, to je javna škola. As for the high school, it's a public school. Za šest zanimanja se obrazuju djeca. And it's a school for six vocations, school for six vocations. Ali i oni to sve lijepo i uredno završe, ali je problem integracije od duša za pošljavanja. But the great challenge is their integration into society especially with regards to employment opportunities. Tako da nam je taj problem, znači država daje od sebe i svoj dio, ali kad treba zajedno se da prihvati takvu osobu, onda ide vrlo teško i većinom ostaju kod kuće. The state is supporting some part of their lives, like schooling, but when they need to support them with employment, then nobody helps, and these children are left at their home. You know, you said a lot, there's so much there. The, the last thing that you said, there's a uh, really powerful um, statement that was made by um, some Italian scholars. Um, that, that matches what you said, where they, they said that like in Italy, where there's such an emphasis on integrazione scolastica, but then, that then in the adult world, that it goes away. And this, uh, these scholars said this is the, the worst betrayal. Give somebody an inclusive school and then um, yeah. So the, I'm not even sure I can remember all of, all of what you said, but there's a couple things I wanted to, to point out. You mentioned about the expectation that if the child gets an assistant, that they should do very well. They should be better. So there's a some really interesting research that came out of um, the UK, uh, led by uh, Peter Blatchford and uh, Rob Webster and uh, uh, Anthony Russell at, at the um, University College at London. And in the UK, they made a decision to hire a lot of assistants. U Britaniji su recimo odlučili da uposli, da zaposli puno asistenata. And after they made the decision, then they did a, they commissioned the research to see what the effect was. I onda su radili istraživanje da vide kakav su efekat imali ti asistenti. And it was at a very um, gross level, the impact, they, they looked at uh, the testing of the students in math, uh, English and science across um, 
across seven grade levels. And they did this in Wales and England. And they looked at students who had similar characteristics. These students had help from assistants. These students didn't have help from assistants. The results that, and this was a very large study, thousands and thousands of students. And there was no intervention. This was just like naturalistically what was happening. They were very surprised by the results that they got. If my memory serves me, uh, there were, um, so there were 21 relationships, 21 correlations, three, three um, test scores across seven grades, so 21. Yeah. In, if, if, again, memory, so this is approximate, it might not be perfect, but in approximately 16 of the correlations, no difference. No difference. In the in the other five, it was a negative relationship. Students who had the a support from an assistant did worse. Then similar students. And they said, this, uh, we don't understand. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense. Uh, so they did a smaller study. They put microphones on the assistants and on the, and on the teachers in, in, a math, in math classes. And then they analyzed the interaction between the teacher and the student and the assistant and the student. And what they found in general, you know, it varies, but in general, they found that when teachers interacted with students, they did many good teaching behaviors. They, they targeted uh, objectives at an appropriate level of difficulty, they, they built on previous learning, they, they scaffolded the learning, they gave good, good correction feedback, good praise, so lots of good teaching. When they looked at what the assistants did, confusing instructions, not good teaching behaviors, they tried to help the students keep up by giving them the answers. They didn't help them understand conceptually the math. And so assistants are not teachers. Yeah, point. Now, some, 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 assistants, some assistants are teachers who can't get jobs as teachers. Yeah, right? but, but, you but you can't count on that. So, you know, uh, and it was a very, but it was a very surprising result. As far as the disruption, um, certainly there are children with different types of disabilities and students without disabilities <laughs> who disrupt. And, and sometimes we have to separate the difference between whether it is bothering us or whether it's actually interfering with the students. Sometimes it bothers us, but it doesn't affect the children. Sometimes it affects the children, right? So sometimes you have to take an action, and you may have to temporarily remove a child. But it's important to, um, it's important to do two things. 
One is it's important to reintroduce that child quickly. Ali druga poenta je da, da to dijete ponovo se vrati u razred. And more importantly is je, to try to figure out what caused the problem je, and to be ahead of the problem. Da saznamo šta je to dovelo do problema i da budemo korak ispred. If you wait for the problem to happen Ako čekamo and then se desi, react, that's not as good as trying to figure out why is this student having this problem. You know, are they seeking attention? Are they bored? Are they trying to escape the situation? Why? And they're trying to deal with that. Ja, samo... Ajde, da malo idemo sada, da je možda jedan komentar, kratki, ako želite. Ne, samo sam htjela reći da ovi koji imaju asistenta, njegovi roditelji, to djete, više misli da asistent treba da uči nego on, a ono koje nema asistenta više razvija svoje kapacitete. No, to je moj izmučno. Uh, assistance to learn. <laughs> small stuff. Like you had one slide similar to that, like where assistant says, Oh now I know math. Now I know right. math you know, right. at higher level. No, one question. Uh I'm Sandra Lakwood, which we met yesterday. Um, my question is what in your opinion would be the best way to prepare assistants in the teaching process? Training, training, until they are eaten alive. <laughs> because we have a situation, as you said, that uh, a lot of different people become te- teaching assistants. I mean, personal assistants to, to the children. And uh, as you said, they, they do work for them and they're... Uh, they are very... Um, they're not, not superior, they're not educated to do so it starts with again going back to the roles because um, if we're preparing them to be the teachers then we're already on the wrong path right so first we got to start with what is the appropriate role for them so that we're training them for an appropriate role when we're training them uh, a number of years ago we did a, a a national project where we developed training materials for paraprofessionals. And one of the things that we did in, in that training, which is different than most trainings, is we had each step of the way uh, with the teacher. Mm-hmm. So even though the teacher wasn't taking the actual training, it was like um, uh, there might be something about like understanding your role and then the assistant would have to go to the teacher and have a conversation about let's clarify what my role is and what I'm supposed to be doing so that the teacher was actually getting the learning at the same time. But after they, uh, they arrange uh, teacher special educator relations. After. So that's first. That's first. And then secondly. Let, let me explain that. Uh-huh. That doesn't happen. What I'm explaining I think is a good idea. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen uh-huh. in most places. Yeah. Okay. In most places Paraprofessionals are hired, they're thrown into a situation, go to it, yeah. you know? You'll be fine. And yeah, you'll be fine, and then maybe they get a little bit of, a little bit of training. Yeah. So in most situations in the U.S., the training situation or the role clarification system is, is, is not, not optimal. So I want to make sure I'm not suggesting that, oh, it's very good yeah. where I am. It's very good. No, 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 no. Lots of work to do. But, um, you know, so the, uh, the um, we want to train them on some very basic things around um, inclusion, cultural competence uh, with children, um, understanding the roles of the different team members and so on, um, how to deal with... Um, behavior, how to implement, and this is really key, how to implement teacher-planned instruction. Because we really don't want the assistants to be designing the instruction. We want the teachers to be uh, designing it. And, and again, in some places, they don't use assistants in instruction. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but um, I understand that there are places in Vietnam that are uh, quite inclusive, and I believe that they uh, have minimal use of paraprofessionals. So there are countries around the world that, um, and they tend to be uh, 
less affluent economically that don't use assistance um, and others that you know use them extensively but the one-to-one -one is really a problem but the, the research you, you mentioned it, it's really interesting to me because um, the UK have, yes yeah. I have a lot of fellow teachers who oppose having uh, 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 an assistant in the classroom because the, the assistant probably don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And they say, ah, it's easier for me to teach the child and then have uh, the assistant work on, on practicing yeah. with, with the student. Right. But they're opposing uh, having the assistant in the classroom because it disrupts the, the, the regular atmosphere in the classroom. The other thing that's happened at the moment. Yeah, we need time. OK. The, the other thing that. Um, a small number of teachers have a problem with assistance is that be, because the assistants are so tightly connected to the student and often to the family, some of the teachers um, feel like the assistant is a spy um, <laughs> and that the assistant goes to the family and tells them certain things. So one of the one of the areas like oh, yeah. confidentiality <laughs> confidentiality is another area of training for paraprofessionals. Okay, so unfortunately, time. all times is up. Uh, like the other day, we had two hours, and we wanted to have four hours with the professor <laughs> because you can learn so much and hear so many interesting things. Um, but unfortunately, we have to move on. Uh, I would like to thank our professor once again and one big applause. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. And now, of course, you are free to join the other sessions and hear other interesting presentations. Thank you very much once again.